Hi, you're listening to Thoughtful Wellness Revolution, where we believe wellness isn't wellness if it's just for you. We're your hosts, Zara and Hien. And before we get started, please make sure to give us a five-star rating and review. Even though we're a podcast that believes in decolonizing, we're still bound to the algorithm. So every little bit that you can help us out, we really appreciate it. And we thank you for all the support. Let's get into it. Hello, and today we're here with our guest, Denise Chang, who is a somatic trauma resolution practitioner and the creator of Consensual Culture, located in, on occupied Kumeye, oh, Kumeye. Kumeye territory, also known as San Diego. Um, thank you for being here with us, Denise. What's on your mind today? And thanks for helping with some pronunciation. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, what's on my mind today? That's a great question. Um, I would say I've been thinking a lot about what it means to be reparenting my inner teenager uh, through my embodied experience. So I had a moment this morning waking up and like feeling this longing in my heart that felt very young, um, my teenage self. And as I attuned to that sensation, it was like this longing for being seen and being loved and um, feeling safe to be who I am. And so I was thinking about the ways that I used to go about having this need met and how it shifted so much for me in my own practice of somatic trauma resolution, really. Um, and how good it feels to be able to meet myself inside that need through my body, through my embodied experience. So that's been on my mind today since you asked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is really interesting. So speaking of that, can you tell us more about how you got into uh, somatics and trauma resolution work? Yeah, what your absolutely. journey was like? Totally. Yes. Thank you for asking. Um, so I, I would say that the first moment I had this awakening in my body was in 2016 when a friend of mine reached out and shared her experiences of a sexual assault with me. Um, and I remember feeling really activated, but I didn't know why. I actually don't remember my own experiences of that. And so I just remember there was like a seed planted in my heart. Like I felt like, where do people who've experienced trauma go to heal? Where do we get the resources that we need that's beyond like go to the you know police and do this and that, like the very logistical kind of resources that are available. What about the long-term healing? What about the reclamation work? What about the embodiment work that's needed? Those were the questions I didn't quite have so articulately back then but it was just like a, a longing of a, a desire to know where these resources were um fast forward two years later um a little bit of my personal story is that i was working at a marketing agency and um because i couldn't get the visa sponsored through the lottery system that the u.s uses for work sponsored visas um i had to stop working and so i had a, a period of time where i wasn't working and i just first remember remembering this time where i had to listen to my intuition and it's a take this yoga teacher training and in that yoga teacher training there was a trauma-informed module and I remember sitting in that circle and the facilitator in his embodiment of what it means to be a trauma resolution practitioner just changed so much for me the deep presence that he held his capacity to speak to my body you know not just my mind and give me information but like there was a certain language that he was using that spoke to deeper parts of me I followed that thread for a while and um, a couple of years later, I did a workshop with my teacher, Rachel Maddox. Um, it was called Rebloom Your Sexuality. And I received a lot of information, this time more specifically to developmental trauma and how developmental trauma actually informs the expression of our sexuality. So that was sort of my, it's been my own personal healing journey over the last two years that really deepened my practice and understanding of somatics uh, and trauma resolution and how they come together but for me the entry point was always sexuality because um that was my personal story and I find that in my you know study of abolition and of um, feminism you know intimate partner violence and uh 
sexuality is so interconnected to the carceral system and patriarchy. So yeah, that's sort of how I've, I've landed here is really through my own personal experience and by listening to my body and like trusting the little um, synchronicities that have guided me to my teachers. Yeah. I love so much what you shared about um, letting your body be the guide of like what your next choice is or where you're going and who you're working with. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I feel so resonant with that. And I think a lot of women are taught or people born as I, people born as women or identified or socialized as women mm -hmm. um, are often like taught to live outside of our bodies cause it's not a safe experience. Yeah. And it's not something we're necessarily conscious of. So that like trusting that inner knowing and like just how that has guided your journey for healing, I think is such a beautiful, beautiful thing. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about like, I guess the benefits of working with a somatic coach and what, what is that like? Yeah, absolutely. I think to answer that question, I might have to define what somatics is to me. Um, and so somatics to me is the capacity, the skills, and the desire to be in relationship with the language of our body. So because trauma lives in the body, somatics teaches us how to, to understand how trauma actually shows up in the body, right? So going beyond um being able to regulate your nervous system which is so important right as you mentioned Zara like we don't live in a culture where folks socialize as women have the skills and even the like know-how nobody talks about it like what does it mean to be embodied we live in a culture that is really disembodied so learning how to regulate our nervous system and create a felt sense of inner safety is so important and I think when it comes to working with a somatics practitioner or a coach um, depending on their training right some coaches teach embodiment my work is about actually turning towards with the right conditions of safe enough um, turning towards the trauma that we've experience in our bodies and learning and understanding its language and then therefore being able to understand its needs and meeting it there with resourcing and um yeah a specific set of skills that allow us to complete a trauma response rather than suppressing it often nervous system regulation is is that it helps us soothe an activation trauma resolution helps us complete that activation that makes sense yeah yeah I think I think that the work that you do is you know so cool and so important mm -hmm. and you know I wonder you know if there are folks listening here and they're thinking to themselves like okay like this is kind of interesting I kind of want to like get into this or like find someone to help me but I'm kind of nervous especially with like dealing with trauma yeah. you know what would you recommend that they do or start with or you know where to go yeah that's a beautiful question thank you I would say you know the skills that I have even as a practitioner are actually really simple and what makes it powerful is the iteration of them the more we use these very simple practices the more um, stronger our relationship to our body becomes. So I would say start by understanding nervous system dynamics. There's actually a ton of resources out there. Um, a lot of books, workshops, you know, teachers that offer um, lessons and teachings on nervous system dynamics. So understanding what a hyper and a hypo arousal is in your body, knowing how to work with these different sensations within the body is a great place to start. Even if it's just I want to feel safe in my body. And what I find is that folks who often just start their embodiment journey, they tend to realize that, wow, I actually have a lot of anxiety. And that makes so much sense because we live in a culture that is fast, right? Capitalism teaches that we need to constantly keep going. And because of the systems of oppression that are at large, these forces often create an inner sense of unsafety. So it is a, a valid and a, a to a certain degree, a healthy response for us to be disembodied right? We need to be able to 
survive, need to be able to meet our needs in whatever way we know how. But if you're ready for it and you're ready to start dismantling and living out, not necessarily outside of, but to be able to thrive inside a system that does not care for us or love us, then we have to make sometimes a hard choice to be able to say, okay, I want to be in relationship with my body and invite and courage to say, all right, I feel anxious. What are the ways I can soothe myself here? You know, when I first, my embodiment journey started in 2019, I would say yoga was a powerful way to teach me how to be in my body. But when it came to nervous system, um, it's been about two and a half, maybe three years. And similarly, when I first practice embodiment, I was like, wow, I'm so anxious all the time. What do I do with this? And it took me, you know, a few months of just learning how to work with that. But I understood nervous system dynamics in order to be able to work with it. And then eventually those practices became stronger and stronger. I began to understand more and more of my own body's language. And then that led to deeper trauma resolution work. Yeah. So starting with the nervous system and learning practices that work for you. You can learn a hundred different practices, but the ones that matter is the one that works for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love so, so much of what you said and related to so much of it that I'm not going to dive into right now, but <laughs> I do want to bring in this really like beautiful point that I think I've seen like from what I know of you and what I've experienced of you that your work does. And I want to think, I want to like name it as like a very important piece of somatic work. If you're going to work with someone is you keep talking about the relationship with the body and like learning the language of it. And I think a big piece of that as well as having a relationship with another person, like a somatic practitioner who is aware of the systemic issues, who's aware of trauma systems and trauma resolution, who's doing their own work. I think, um, yeah, just building that safe relationship is such an important piece of healing. And I really love the way you talk about the way it naturally comes across how you do that in your, in your work and how you help people do that within their bodies, like build that relationship. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. I, I personally wouldn't be where I am without my teachers and, and being in their, the presence of their own capacity to be in relationship to their body. So yeah, it, it requires all of us doing this work for us to really make the change. So thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know that you created um, consensual culture, and I was wondering if you could share more about exactly, you know, what it is, what that goes on. Yeah, totally. Oh, I love this. Um, so I actually, just as a little like disclaimer, I don't feel fully comfortable with the title like creator of consensual culture, because the truth is, this body of work, this, this living, breathing, dynamic framework, it, it sort of came to me as like a download. And I remember just like writing, sort of like, almost like channeling this, this, this framework. And so I wouldn't say I'm the creator, but I felt like it, it existed through the works of many, 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 many that came before me. And I sort of just synthesized it somehow through my own, like, you know, intuition, let's say, for lack of a better word. Um, consensual culture is this idea that we heal in relationships, but what are the skills and the values that we need in order to practice healing in relationship? Understanding that we are often, you know, most of us are conditioned inside of these systems. So unless we're doing our own personal work, we often, you know, uh, project from that, that conditioning, right? So consensual culture teaches us the skills to be able to turn towards these systems within our own body to understand how they show up and use the values of interdependence, intersovereignty, integrity, co-creation and compassion. So these are the five core values. And the practice of these five values is what helps us feel like we can relate to one another, that challenges codependency, that challenges um, the ways that these systems have told us how we relate to one another, right? By relating through our differences. But what if we could be in the embodiment of our worthiness, of our sovereignty, of our truth, our heart's truth, what would it be like to relate from that place instead? And not many of us have been taught to do so. Again, understanding that forces at large have diminished that capacity. So consensual culture to me is still like, you know, I, I, 
tried to teach it through a um, group program and it was doing it injustice. It's like, no, this, this body of work, it, it lives and breathes through my own relationships. So I'm a steward of it. I'm still a student of it as well. Um, I'm writing about it. I'm talking about it with friends. I'm practicing it in my relationships. Um, it's still very new. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to see where it'll take me and, and how it might support our healing as a collective because I really believe in it. And I, I know that there's a lot of work for me to do in my own practice and embodiment of it. Uh, but so far, these values have given me so much clarity on um, why we need it. We need consensual culture. We need to be in consent with our own limits, needs, and desires. And how do we relate from that place with one another? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's consensual culture. And Zara, you mentioned earlier too, like the, the relationship that we have with our practitioners are so important. And I think consensual culture teaches me how to be a practitioner that celebrates the sovereignty of my client as well, that they're not dependent on me to be able to create inner safety. But as a practitioner, I am teaching my clients how to be in relationship with their own needs, desires, and limits so that they can trust themselves, so that they understand the language of their nervous system to be able to do this work beyond our container. Um, and often too, for example, like say I grew up not really feeling um, really met by a paternal figure. If I didn't really have that growing up, I'm going to try and seek that through my relationships with men, very likely. It's the truth. <laughs> I have tried to seek that. <laughs> like oh, let's talk in theory here we've actually, all been there <laughs> yeah it's like never mind it's actually the truth <laughs> um and and in doing so I'm I'm often not relating from a place of worthiness of, of worthy of love right regardless of whether it came from a paternal source but I'm, I'm looking for it because I'm human and I I'm I'm a relational being and I I want to feel loved and seen that's what makes me human that's what helps me feel I like I belong and I'm safe um but if I had never had that then what is the the, the, the blueprint, where is the source of paternal love that I can feel in my body so that when it does uh, show up, it's not coming from a place of like, I need this and this is the only way and person I can get it from. That's where our attachment styles tend to come up. That's when our codependency patterns show up, right? So if I'm working on my sense of self-worth and sovereignty, I'm much better able to relate to a, a man, right? If I were to be in a relationship with them without having these, these um, the, the wounded part of me, the, the, the part of me that didn't receive paternal love taking over. And it has happened, right? And so this work really teaches me, consensual culture teaches me how to be in relationship with that younger part of myself. It's the thing that I woke up with this morning, right? Like, how do I be in relationship with this younger self so that I can give her this felt sense of love um, and continue to build it inside my body to feel this like satisfiability that I learned from Adrienne Marie Brown, one of my um, teachers as well, um, that if we know how to feel satisfied in our body, what would that change for us? Yeah. How would that dismantle capitalism inside of us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for, you know, saying that or sharing all of that. Um, you know, that last sort of question is like kind of really blowing my mind because I feel, um, first of all, I'm, I feel like, gosh, I should like really work with you. But <laughs> second, I, I feel like what's hard for me is that, you know, I am a trauma-informed yoga teacher. And so like, I, I do understand like the nervous system mm -hmm. and as well as like, I, I am somebody who really understands like the, the bigger systems at play that makes it hard for us to be embodied and, you know, be in relationship with ourselves. And I also, I also still find myself like struggling, I guess, like, even though I understand these things, I feel like I struggle to really be, um, embodied and be in relationship with myself like I find myself lately so like just exhausted because I'm really just trying to like make it through the next day living in a pandemic yes. living with late stage capitalism and all the ugly things about it and so like yeah like do you have any like thoughts on that for like I don't know for someone like me or just you know other people who are like yeah I get what I get what she's saying but like mm. it's still so difficult or it feels so difficult Absolutely. It feels so like overwhelming. Truly. Yeah, I agree. It, it really is. I don't want to at all diminish like 
the reality of the current conditions that we live inside of late stage capitalism pandemic you mentioned this shit is ex- i'm sorry <laughs> this stuff is <laughs> this stuff is we're exhausting. a pro cursing podcast <laughs> okay great <laughs> i was like oops <laughs> um yeah it, it's exhausting we're not meant to live in these conditions they're not conducive to our sense of well-being right to to re- what is well-being even mean inside of these conditions so yeah i think the one thing that i would i would say is to keep going keep being like so self-loving and self-compassionate and so accepting towards the ways that you've had to survive yes even for those of us who have to just push through the pain to make it another day that's so valid that's okay and can you love yourself there can you love yourself in the ways that you wish things were different but they're not right now I think when we are able to hold this both and of I wish things were different but this is where I'm at right now I think it allows for more self-compassion and another thing that I, I would say is for me has really supported me when times are really really hard is community is is showing up to build deep and loving relationships with others who may understand the same language as me who also see the ways these systems have harmed us um and finding a sense of belonging inside of that it's almost like being able to hold the pain together rather than individually because when in, in when we're holding our own pain and we don't reach out we're isolating ourselves and who benefits when we isolate ourselves yeah mm-hmm. yeah wow thank you so much like i really needed to hear that today like i really needed to hear that today because i i very much feel that I don't want it to be this way and it is Mm -hmm. and I'm trying my best (laughs) you know like all all those things that um I'm holding and trying to not um uh trying to not go into that isolation you know I feel like it's very easy to go into that isolation of like okay I'm struggling and I'm just struggling and Mm -hmm. and and forgetting that community is possible basically which it always it always is I find even during the hardest times, community is always possible. Mm. Um, I'm wondering, you know, we always ask everybody this um, and we ask, you know, what's one thing you want to see more of in wellness and what's one thing you want to see less of in wellness? Mm. Um, And this could be more generally the wellness field, but this could also be in particular to, you know, trauma resolution or what you are um, doing. Yeah, I think the work that y'all are doing is, is so important. I think we need more spaces where conversations like these are being had. Yeah, that we need to and must. It is imperative that we weave in the context of systemic trauma into our conversations, into our healing, into our well-being. I find that there can be a, a huge lack um, of that in the wellness industry. Is We're trauma-informed, but to what degree are you really looking at trauma so I wish that there were more of that more conversations and I I do see it starting and that's why I just love the work that y'all are doing so more of this more of this (laughs) um yeah less of less of in the wellness industry oh that's a hard one um you know I, I I find yeah it's a little challenging for me because I think to each their own. I, I, I fully trust that every single person has their path and whatever avenue you're going to find your way back to yourself, even if it's at the very beginning, just crystals or learning how to work with chakras. Um, of course, you know, we want to be able to have, again, the lens of systemic oppression inside of the work that we're doing. So with that, I would say, you know, anything that makes us feel a little bit more okay inside of not okay situations. <laughs> I would say that, yeah, it's hard for me to, to necessarily say less of this, less spiritual bypassing, please, less white dominated spaces, please, less, you know, sage burning, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> no, we love it because it's, if, if wellness wasn't so co-opted by capitalism yes. mm-hmm. in white supremacy, we wouldn't have the issue of being like, oh, you don't know the chakra system well, or you don't know the history of it because it would be integrated yeah. in learning about it. Yeah, oh, yeah. Exactly. All that stuff can be like a gate into understanding yourself more and understanding things more. Yeah, yeah, that's so beautiful. Thank you. Um, 
And we are so grateful to have you in our space because we really admire your work. Um, yeah, yeah. And can you let our friends here at the podcast know how to get in touch with you? Friends are yeah. your listeners. You're our friends now. Yes, we are all friends now. Please, please feel free to reach out to me on Instagram. That's my primary um, form of sharing content right now. Uh, it's Denise Dimensional. Maybe y'all can share that in show notes or something. Um, Instagram, and I have a website, consensualculture.com. It's currently in the works because, again, I've been really sitting with how this, this dynamic living thing wants to be channeled through me in the form of however. So um, consensualculture.com and Instagram at Denise Dimensional is a great place to start. Um, should I talk a little bit about what ways people can work with me? Is that something that feels good? Okay. Um, so I offer one-on-one -on -one sessions. Uh, the containers tend to be a bit longer because trauma resolution work does require time. You know, usually we start by building capacity, building capacity to hold um, our, um, our subtle bodies, right? The emotional body, the energetic body. Um, and then we go deeper. I also host workshops on, on nervous system regulation, on, on how to work with our uh, attachment style. So workshops as well. And currently I, I primarily focus on working with folks of color. Um, I just find it really important that we have spaces without the white gaze. So um, yeah, but, you know, all's welcome to my Instagram. <laughs> Thank you so much, Denise, for your time and for sharing all the lovely things you did. Um, we really appreciate you. Yeah, likewise. These were such great, great questions. I really appreciate it being able to share it with y'all. So this is our post interview and we talked to Denise and I really needed that. <laughs> I really needed Denise's beautiful energy and all the wisdom that she shared. Um, I also did. Gosh, it was, it's, I think we have talked about it several times off the podcast and maybe this has come up earlier in the season and probably another season in season one, but like I have become so disillusioned with coaching and as someone who like marketed themselves or was, or I don't even like, you know, I was a coach. I am a coach. I have a coaching certification. I like the, it's, the industry is so broken. So to hear someone like Denise, who is aware of the dynamics, not only like on an intellectual level, but on a somatic level and how they present and how they can impact your work with the client or how they can impact a client differently than they impact you, I just think is so beautiful. Right on. Yeah, it, it is so beautiful. And I don't know, I just feel so deeply grateful for Denise and all the work they're doing and excited to see you know, what's next with consensual culture. And I also like in the last interview we had with our guests, I also felt really held by Denise. Mm. And I think that's just really cool. You know, when I, I just felt like there was a sort of um, mutuality to uh, having Denise as a guest that I just really appreciate that you just don't always get. Absolutely. I think it's like, um, and this isn't that like other guests have not done this. I think there's just a space of coming without armor of being able to hold and be held. Um, and yeah, thank you, Denise, for bringing that to us and Chi Chi. That was our last guest, right? Yeah. 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 It's, it's great. I just, I just think that well, I just say that doing this is great with you, Zara. So first, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for being my co-host on this adventure. And, you know, to our listeners, like, we really hope that these conversations, you know, are interesting or helpful or inspire you because every time I do this, it just reaffirms me why we have to keep doing this. Oh my God, yes. Um, also, it's interesting that you took the words out of my mouth because I was going to say, I think that um, us working together and like the space you and I create creates a space that people can be held in you know what I mean and and hold space for us as well so I think I am really grateful for you as well on this journey um, 
yeah, I'm not going to lie. I forgot the second part of what you were talking about. Um, I, I think you caught, I think you got all of it. I mean, it was basically yeah. grateful for you. Oh, and- uh, the space we're creating here. Yeah. yeah. And I, what I wanted to say is for our listeners, um, we do really hope this, that these conversations are sparking thoughts or other conversations for you. And um, yeah, we're open to hearing what y'all are um, thinking about when you have these conversations. And I don't know that we've ever said this, but I do want to give our email address out um, that if anyone has any thoughts or if you know someone who you think would be a good guest for the podcast, please feel free to email us because I think part of the importance of these conversations and continuing to have them is building a community. And I'm not saying like, we have to lead all of the conversations and the community, but um, we know some really lovely people have connected with our, our podcast so far. So we would love to hear, you know, anyone. Um, what is our email address, Ian? <laughs> I will put it in the show notes, but it's thoughtfulwellnessrevolution at gmail.com. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. See, real easy there. I should right. have known that. Um, we it is what it is um but we do like to ask because we always ask our guests what's on your mind today Hian what is on my mind today Zara is that I I am going through it so I should say that today that we're talking and recording, it's January 21st, 2022, and it is Mercury retrograde. It's also Venus retrograde, you know, for the people who know about astrology. If you don't, it just means that things are really intense and uh, communication issues, tech issues might happen. And um, I'm really exhausted. It's just been making me really exhausted. And Uh, you know what? That's it. I'm just, I've just been really exhausted. Um, and I'm holding that both and of like, I'm really fucking exhausted and it gives me a lot of energy to be here doing this with you, Zara. So it's like the weirdest, (laughs) it's like the weirdest both and, um, that I'm experiencing. It's like, I'm so fucking tired of life and doing this gives me life. (laughs) So that's what, on my mind but so I don't forget what's on your mind Zara yeah no no um I first and foremost I want to say I appreciate your honesty it's so easy to brush past life being hard um and so I appreciate your honesty and sharing that with all of us and what's on my mind is I am feeling really inspired lately by this podcast and working with you and all of our lovely guests um Obviously, I don't feel inspired all the time because I'm still having neck issues if you listen to last week's episode. Um, <laughs> I, so, but that's nothing we can do anything about right now. But I'm feeling like inspired in the sense of that hope. There's a space that we're starting to co- like recognize grief and experience collective grief. And that makes space for collective growth and collective joy and individual collective, all of it beautiful. It's, we're getting to the point of people knowing about the oppressive systems and the issues, right? So like, I think that's a really important point to be because at some points it feels hopeless. You know what I mean? Where it's like, yeah, we all fucking know that our healthcare system is bullshit and our political parties are um, fueled by the money of like 12 dudes. Um, Right. But like, and then, then recognizing the intersectionality and how that affects all of us, right? So people are starting to recognize that and it starts to feel hopeless because like, what the fuck are we going to do? Um, but that I'm, for the first time, feeling like small community action is around and happening and I'm reminded of like how I want to find my role in it and how I think that's where we're all kind of getting to is like, okay, shit is crumbling. How the hell do we what's my role you know and so I feel inspired in that way as in like I have no fucking clue what I'm doing I don't know what my role is I don't know where I'm going I don't know where any of us are going um but I feel like 
this podcast, the space we're in right now has given me the hope and inspiration to think that something is coming and that we're building it. So, yeah. Yeah. I, you know what? I totally get that. I feel like it's something that I think that I'm hearing you saying is that things are happening. Like we may not know exactly what is happening or how it's going to look like, but things are happening. Uh, Similar to how like Denise was talking about how they're not sure about how consensual culture is going to look, but that things are, you know, feeling out the vibe for things to happen. And I think that is something that is going on with um, a lot more people are waking up, right? Like a lot, you're right. Like a lot of people are kind of seeing, I think, um, like the illusion is slowly falling apart, right? The illusion that we live in a democracy and not an oligarchy, you know, the illusion that we really live in a meritocracy where you just got to work really hard, you know, or, you know, whatever other BS that we were told in history class as kids (laughs) about why the world is great and perfect the way it is and does not need to change. Um, I think people are waking up and I think part of that, and I don't know, I don't, maybe we'll get into this or maybe I'll edit this out, but I'm curious if you think like, or well, first I'm going to share what I think and then I'll ask you what you think. But like, I'm feeling like slowly people are starting to see a little bit of urgency in taking action. And I'm wondering what you think about that because for me, I feel like, like I understand that urgency is like uh, one of the tenets of white supremacy. And so we don't want to live in urgency, right? Like we don't want to like, be urgent all the time to the point where it burns us out but I also have been wishing that there was more like collective urgency and I think I'm finally kind of seeing that a little bit which kind of sucks I'm like finally seeing that a little bit but I want to hear your thoughts on that um I definitely agree and I want to so just to try to find a different word for it the word that came up for me was immediacy you know what I mean like it's not urgent like people are breathing down our neck, but it's immediate. Like, Hey, if we don't do something about this, um, spilt milk now, it's going to ferment and rot and be moldy and gross or do whatever milk does. I don't drink milk. So I don't know. (laughs) What a metaphor, like gross, but yes, exactly that. Right. It's like, Oh, we didn't spill water this time. We spilled milk and we really need to clean this up. So like immediately versus like urgent where it's like, if we don't do this now, like the milk is going to attack us, which, you know, feels like white supremacy competition vibes, you know, like that's where the, yeah. Um, yeah. I do feel that now as well, because even like, even people who I don't think were necessarily, and I fucking hate this term, but like woke, quote unquote you know what I mean um even people like I feel like or people who are like I just want to fucking not deal with this or I want to you know they're even starting to be like okay I guess I, we have to do something and I got to figure out what I'm gonna do and because it's like none of the rest of it matters Um, because I feel like a lot of people are out there being like we need revolution and it's like y'all don't understand revolution is violent lots of people die Um, the the masses are not supported the working class is not supported in that like we don't want that we want to build new systems so let's all be a part of building new systems and I think that's kind of where people are starting to recognize that like we don't want to be a part of a civil war we would like to not live under this system anymore though And I appreciate that. I think you're right. Yeah, we're all like more people are starting to get to a point where it's like, we got to do something. Yeah. No one's coming to save us. (laughs) That's for sure. Like if that, if you haven't learned that yet, like two years in the pandemic, like, yeah, that's where we're at. And, you know, I feel like, yeah, basically I agree with what you're saying. And I feel like, similarly of like I've been that person who feels like oh I want a revolution but like really I don't right it's like the thing is I guess what's the thing is though like I'm finding that slowly it is becoming more um enticing to want change though right like like I think about the quote I forgot who said it but there's a quote along the lines of how like 
the job of the artist is to make revolution seem irresistible. I'm like paraphrasing. I'll put the actual quote once I find it um, in the show notes. And so I feel like slowly we're at a certain point in history and current events where it's becoming more enticing to at least want the system to change or at least know that like we can't keep going like this. Like it's fucking unsustainable. Like it's just so fucking unsustainable. And like finally people can like agree to that because I think maybe even like at the beginning of the pandemic, I think a lot of people were in denial of like, yeah, it really sucks right now, but that's just because right now, because we're going through something really weird. And so we're going to try to go back to normal. And then last year in 2021, we tried to go back to normal, but it really didn't work that well because the systems were not designed to really uh, help us survive a pandemic. Um, And so now people are seeing in 22, like, oh yeah, like, it's really not working. Like it's not sustainable and there has to be something else. We don't know what it is, but we got to consider that something else could be an option instead of same old same. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because well, and I also think in 2020 people, a lot of people, I'm going to call them liberals, Democrats, people on the left um, were like, oh, well, once we get him out Trump out of office everything will be back to normal and it's like things have not been normal since I don't know the 80s um when they started trying to sell us this lie and things have definitely not been and like so once they reckon sorry I'm going on a tangent there but um once they recognize that um our current sitting president Joseph Biden was um not going to do shit for any of us. And I'm not mad about it. It's fine. I'm not mad about it. Um, I'm infuriated by it, Um, but I'm not surprised. Um, Once people came to that reckoning, which I think a lot of us already knew that it's, this isn't an issue of who is in the office. It's who we're choosing to even vote on to put in the office and all of the multitude of things that go into that. You know what I mean? And like the fact that we don't care about humanity, I could list a different, a million different problems, but I'm just going to go with like the fact that we have, you know, money picking politicians and um, the fact that all of these systems dehumanize us. Um, And people were like, yeah, 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 not ready for that. Yeah, I think absolutely to what you said. The only other thing I would say is that it hasn't been normal ever. I think we were, when you really look at the history of the U.S., I don't think any of it is normal. I think we're taught to accept it as normal, but it is, it's like awful. <laughs> like it's just not good. And and so in a way I'm not surprised, but I guess it's that urgency or immediacy of like, okay, fi- part of me f- feels like, okay, finally you're seeing that none of this is normal. And, you know, I think for some of these people, they're not there yet, but I hope eventually they'll really look back at history and be like, actually, none of this was normal, you know? Um, and I'm just, I, I just got to keep it like that. Cause you know, I don't want the FBI arresting me for anything, <laughs> you know, but I'm just saying like, none of this is normal. None of this is okay. Um, but we are, we, we kind of just accept it because we need to survive, right? Like we just kind of have to accept it because we have to survive. And so um yeah, I definitely feel like, how much do we want to become a political podcast, Zara? But I definitely feel like, you know, people are waking up to the fact that our president is not as great as we may have hoped. Uh, I definitely am not surprised, but it is infuriating, right? Because it is it is infuriating to see somebody in power not use their power to help people. Isn't that weird? Like what the fuck? (laughs) Um, It's okay. And I know this is like showing a bit of my business background here. It's like those, there's like a, a graphic from one of my, I don't know, business classes where it was like, and I'm sure this is like a thing where it's like a manager stands on the desk and makes everyone pull him. You know what I mean? And like, tells people what to do while a leader stands in the front and shows them how to lead the thing and pull it or whatever. And I feel like people thought the problem was that we didn't have 
the right guy in office. And it's like, no, it's that we don't have a leader. You know what I mean? Nobody's willing to get their hands dirty and say like, um, well, I'm almost 80 years old and I know I took a shit ton of money and bribes from um, student loan offices and companies so that I, you know, lobbyists so that uh, we racked up an entire generation full of debt. Um, but, you know, I'm going to die soon. So it doesn't matter. I can just say, fuck it and cancel student loan debt. But instead, we have a man who said, no, no, I'll just put it on hold until I am sure that I'm going to get reelected or whatever. Well, I just feel like even though our lead, our so-called leaders are not really helpful. Many They're of not us, leaders. They're managers. We right. have middle-class so managers. Ma- many <laughs> of our managers of the system that we're in are not helpful. I think many people, I would say, including us, Zara, are rising to the occasion to become leaders in our own way. And that yeah. is something hopeful that I've been feeling. Um, yeah, well, there's that quote from the Dalai Lama, which you're going to have to quote because I won't remember. Um, it, it will be in the show notes, everyone. Um, but it's like, we don't need more business people and successful people. We need like more artists and storytellers that are like leaders in their fields of all different kinds. And like, if you're listening to this and you feel called that, you know, you are a leader of some sort of way and not in like a, you know, everything, but in like a, you care about something and you're passionate and it shares within your values and you want to share that with other people or, and it stands within your values and you want to share that with other people, then, um, this is also space and time for you now because we need us. We need us all. Um, we're building a tapestry and a chain mail, which Denise talks about. We talk about with uh, Denise in our episode and, bonus episode in our bonus episode with Denise so if you subscribe to our sub stack you can listen to it there um we talk about how um you know are we in our lifetime gonna get to see like I'm just gonna call it like an integrated space like this vision we're all holding of what could be are we gonna get to see that and we kind of talked about it in the sense of it being more like a chain mail or like a tapestry, like a chain mail in the sense of like it's small circles coming together and building something really strong. Um, and that is really beautiful because we can create those little communities and build those connections and link us all together. Um, and it's we don't, but it's also like a tapestry, like we're building something, but we don't know what it's going to look like, but it's going to be beautiful. Um, and we all have our space in it. And it's, we're done looking to our, we're done looking to America's fucking middle management to tell us what's up. I'm done. <laughs> you know, that's a perfect analogy for how the country is actually. Oh my God. Like he doesn't have any real say, you know what I mean? It's just some fucking faceless guys telling him yes or no. And so let's all quit. We're in the fucking, (laughs) what is it? The great resignation of 2021. Yeah. And now we're 2022. Let's keep going. Yeah. We're all quitting. We're starting something new. (laughs) Yeah. That is how things have been going for us this week. And um, we hope you have, I don't know, Hien, do you have anything else you want to share or feel called to say? Um, I love you all. And yes, I support Mm. you if you quit or if you want to start a strike or start a union where you're at. (laughs) This is becoming a political podcast and I love it. (laughs) Is it political? I don't think it's political. I think it's human focused. You know what I mean? And that is wellness. Wellness is humanity focused and fucking right now we have to give a shit about politics, um, which I refuse to submit to. Um. Yeah, sorry. Didn't mean to get a bit dark there, but yeah. So yeah, uh, have a lovely yeah. rest of your day, y'all. Thank yeah, you for listening. You. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Thoughtful Wellness Revolution podcast. 
For bonus content, you can go to thoughtfulwellnessrevolution.substack.com and subscribe for $5 a month. You can also follow us on Instagram at Thoughtful Wellness Revolution to share your thoughts. And don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you're listening.